मा हेलो हेलो अक्षय यस सर स्पीकर जो है ना कि तारा नो सर आई डोंट सी ओके मैसेज मारते हैं ओके जॉन आगे मेसेज मे सर Yeah, uh, he has joined. I think, uh, Akshay. 
uh, so we start seven two it is right another one minute uh, let's wait okay in about one minute yeah yeah fine fine uh, okay. we will uh, introduce then you can start sir okay okay, okay. Uh, Uh, shall we uh, start, Akshay? Or how many participants are there? Uh, like... Sir, nearly 70. Okay. Uh, shall we uh, start, Akshay, or uh, do we need to wait? We can start, sir. We can start, right? Okay. Very good evening and warm welcome to all the participants on the third day of the lecture series come FDP on protein characterization using bioinformatics tools. It's another day we brought you probably the most discussed topic in the world, that is drug discovery. It has become a challenge for pharmaceutical industries to develop innovative drugs. Today, every one of us can understand the bioinformatics become a major part of drug discovery pipeline, playing a key role for validating drug targets and drug discovery. In this context, students, ladies and gentlemen, please join me welcoming our today's esteemed speaker, Dr. J.C. Smiley D., Graduate Teaching Assistant, Department of Chemistry, University of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. He was also working as Graduate Assistant, Lockhead University, Thunder Bay, Canada, lecturer in Tijon College, Bioinformatics Technician, Proj in Biosciences. He has also published many research articles in national and international journals. Over to you, sir. Um, just well, thank you very much for introducing me, Dr. Sudipta Ji, and um, and I'm honored and humbled at the at the same time um, to talk to you, to speak speak amongst you, and and also for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to share my slides with you right now. Uh, just. Hold on with me. So my topic today is uh, um, bioinformatics and drug discovery. And I'm from this university, University of Guelph, which is in Guelph City. Uh, which is about 60 minutes drive from Toronto um, in Canada. And uh, uh, before I go into the topic, this is one of the iconic buildings of the university and uh, one of the oldest buildings. And this is a mascot for the university, which, uh, which is a sculpture of, that, uh, of Griffin, which stands at the beginning of the university. I thought I would share with, with you about that. Well, um, in this presentation, the outline of my, um, of my presentation is this. Firstly, I'm going to talk about bioinformatics as a backdrop, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to introduce to you the conventional drug discovery process, and I'll talk about 
how the bioinformatics fits into this drug discovery process. And uh, um, I'll talk about structure-based drug designing, which is going to be the meat of the talk. And, um, and I'll give an application of drug designing um, and then I'll summarize my talk. Well, um, back in the 1990s, when internet became a, a huge thing, there was an explosion of data of, of genome and protein sequences, especially with the uh, Human Genome Project in 1990s. It started in 1990s and, and finished in 2001, um, ended up creating a huge amount of data which should be stored in data, databases which were available for the public um, via these da da databases called GenBank and DDBJ. DDBJ stands for DNA Data Bank of Japan, which is maintained by Japan, and GenBank is maintained by the USA. Well, soon after several genome uh, sequencing projects joined and the, the, the data kept increasing, and then, <clears throat> and then soon after that, um, Protein Data Bank came into existence um, this data bank consists of protein structures, which are 3D structure protein structures, which, which were identified using X-ray crystallographic structures from all over the world, and they're and they're deposited into a protein data bank, which now is curated and given IDs for each of the entries. Now um, it's publicly available. Now all you can all you have to do is go to the database and download the uh, protein structure and start working with it uh, and working with it in 3D. So it's a huge uh, advantage now. And, and there are other, other databases like SwissProt and PIR. PIR stands for Protein Information Repository, and this is for protein sequences. Well, with, with, the, uh, with the advent of these databases, um, there, there is a development of tools um, we call that as a bioinformatics tools. And these tools are useful for uh, understanding and interpreting certain scientific information. Um, well, so bioinformatics is a truly interdisciplinary science. I'm sorry, is, is somebody saying something? Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna continue. And uh, uh, bioinformatics is a truly interdisciplinary science and multidisciplinary. And most of the jobs in bioinformatics is available in in software development field because they have a product to sell to the scientists where, where computer science people come in and create tools that, that, that are useful to, um, useful to uh, data mine from these databases which are useful back for our scientific experiments. Well, if you are from biotechnology, biochemistry, chemistry, or biology, you can use these bioinformatics tools in your research to get a leading edge on the research. Um, well, this um, bioinformatics is also useful in drug discovery in a very similar fashion. And I'm going to talk about the uh, drug, conventional drug discovery, how it happens first, and then go into details later. And firstly, you identify a disease, and then you identify a target protein that is causing the disease. And, you and then you identify a lead or a analog or a protein sorry, or a, or a uh, ligand for the protein. And these leads, what they do is these ligands, they bind to the protein at the active site and bring about a conformational change that essentially neutralizes its function or inhibits it and thereby, you know, curing the disease. So, but in this case of lead discovery, each protein active site, here you can see the structure of a protein and the, the, the protein um, in, in this model is a stick model where you can't clearly see the morphology of the active site. So here I've put forward a surface filled uh, structure where you can actually see the active site here and, uh, and a ligand is already bound into it. Well, this, this lead discovery is a huge uh, process because 
uh, each protein will end up having hundreds of thousands of leads that are binding with a different uh, um, range of binding affinities. And you have to identify a lead that is actually causing the required response in a protein. Some leads actually antagonize the protein. Some leads actually agonize the protein. So uh, you need to know what to do with the lead. So once you have that information and you develop a drug from it, you call those leads as drugs. Until then, you call them leads or analogs or ligands and so on. So when a, a, a lead is bound, an analog is bound to the protein active site, it binds with these uh, uh, hydrogen bonding uh, bonds, which are represented here as a dotted line, or other, there are other methods of binding like uh, hydrophobic, if they're both hydrophobic, they, they usually have physis option, chemis option and so on. Well, um, the, the dictionary definition of a drug is a substance that is used as, you know, as a medication, but of a drug is where it actually binds to the active site and brings about the conformational change. Well, the, uh, today we are going to look at small organic molecule drugs. These mo organic molecule drugs are often less than 500 daltons of molecular weight because these molecules are administered orally and they, they go, they have to be absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream. And, and we hope this bloodstream takes the, the drug compound to the intended target where it, it can actually create the response. Um, and, and there is another class of drugs, which are protein molecule, which has a huge size, but they cannot be taken orally, but they have to be intravenously injected. But these are a small portion of the drugs anyway. So we are going to talk about small molecule drugs. In a conventional drug discovery process, it, it takes 10 to 15 years and a huge amount of laborious process of clinical trial with a huge amount of cost, few billions of dollars, to mm -hmm. identify a single FDA approved drug from hundreds of thousands of potential candidates. And uh, this information I got from uh, this website, CSDD, uh, Center for Study of Drug Development, they got this information from FDA. And, and this potentially shows the, 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 how inefficient the process is, where you, you take hundreds of thousands of drug candidates and they all fail, most of them fail in preclinical stage, and then most of them fail in clinical stage, and, and finally end up, we end up with one or one drug that is approved by the FDA. Here, uh, in the, in the basic research, they identify the tar target protein. In the dr drug discovery process, this is where they identify the drug candidates. And bioinformatics plays a huge role in this area of the entire process, drug discovery process, where we can actually identify the drug candidates that are more, that have more potential to pass through the pipeline and be more probable to be approved as a medicine. So if you use bioinformatics here, it, it potentially um, saves a lot of cost and saves a lot of time. And, uh, and uh, so I'm gonna talk about how we gonna actually do about it. So drug candidates can be a huge range of molecules because the only rule, only few rules that we set are, it should be less than 500 Daltons and some of the, uh, um, Lipinski rules that, that, that tells you what kind of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity it should have and so on and so forth. So with these, with these set uh, rules, we can identify probably with permutation combinations of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, we can have potentially 10 to the power of 62 organic molecules, which is stupendous amount uh, for us to screen a single drug target with. And so the most sensible way of doing it is actually the way they do today in the drug discovery where they usually get these compounds that are known ligands that have compatibility with our body. So like for uh, a ligand that is like analog, so um, with, with, which, which has more probability of being, being you know, accepted in the clinical trials or uh, from the medicinal plants or fungi sources and so on. 
And there's another way of doing it. This is um, basically stealing a drug. This is where um, this drug is is already passed through the clinical trial. Uh -huh. And uh, and hello, sorry uh, to interrupt you, sir. Uh, yeah. Like you just disable the annotation there. I think uh, we can see some scratch uh, on the slide, or someone is. Uh, I think uh, you can disable the annotation. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, I, there, is, there is an option. Akshay, can you uh, just uh, guide, sir? Like uh, okay. uh, doing the uh, annotation. Anot disabling the annotation, like in the uh, setting. Hello, Akshay. I I saw the annotation. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, disable, disable annotations. Yeah, yeah, disable annotation. Um, I went there, but I don't know. Oh. Um, there's an option at the top, sir. More options, more screen sharing options. Okay. Uh, yes, I saw these options where if you go to Anote, right? And uh, it gives set of options here, but I don't know where is disabled. Sir, there'll be uh, allow participants to annotate. Just uh, make sure that that is not uh, set to yes. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you for that. Well, so the 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 other uh, the other way of finding a drug, sensible way of finding a drug is basically stealing a drug compound. Um, the the drug compound that has been already been declared a drug for another disease, you can take it take that drug because you know it has already passed through all the hoops and then improve that drug, um, basically keeping its skeleton intact and changing its um, um, peripheral moieties uh, using structural structure-based designing, drug designing method. And by doing this, you're, you're actually having a potential drug that is going to pass through all the hoops easily. And it's going to be, uh, if once you know that this is actually efficient in, in controlling the disease, you can actually have a potential drug uh, within no time. Well, there's another method as well, basically designing a de novo drug, which is from scratch, but this is not recommended um, mostly. So an example of, of a drug called metamorphin, metformin, um, uh, which look, this is the structure of the metformin, which was identified from French lilac uh, plant originally, and this is uh, used for diabetes mellitus type two for a long time. Uh, and it was originally identified in 1920s and passed through all clinical trials in 1957. And it's most, like, most prescribed and safest drug in the world. And recently they've identified that they, it has a potential anti-cancer effects in epidemiology studies. So now uh, you can use this drug and probably change uh, the, uh, uh, um, tweak with its um, um, moieties, H2 um, molecule here, and keeping the structure intact, you can probably start uh, the drug designing process. So this drug designing process uh, is, is two types. Uh, it's structure-based drug designing. It is based on the structure of the protein active site or based on the structure of the analog itself. So in, in case where you know the drug protein target and, and you know the active site, then you can probably tweak the uh, analog in certain way by, um, by monitoring its interactions with the, in the active site and change the, um, um, the peripheral moieties and then do the drug, drug discovery process. But in case you don't have a structure of the protein, which is mostly the case because um, several proteins doesn't have uh, 3D structures already available. Uh, we only have a, a portion of proteins already 3D uh, crystallography structures available. In that case, we can go on into, into structure-based designing, but based on the structure of the analog, they call it computer-aided drug designing. And mostly it's called as QSPRs or QSAR. 
um, it stands for quantitative to structure property relationship or quantitative structure activity relationship. Basically, what is what you're doing is going back to that slide where taking this molecule and and uh, and uh, testing it on experimentally on a cell line and getting IC50 values, um, which tells the drug response, and um, and then you sequentially change these moieties from electron donating to electron accepting mo moieties or hydrogen donating hydrogen um, accepting moieties and so on. And, uh, and create a series of analogs, uh, keeping the um, skeleton structure intact. And you have a series of drug activities for a different analogs. And you can relate this activity by how you're changing the moiety. Once you have this data, you can also uh, get physical chemical properties from, we also call them descriptors, uh, which is literally the same as physical chemical properties. Uh, we can calculate them using a comput computational software. Uh, these properties can be wide ranging. They can be steric, hydrophobic, or electrostatic properties. They can be calculated using the uh, mathematical formulation. And some it also uses some experimental results uh, as a basis as well. So we call them semi-experimental or also semi-empirical properties. So once you calculate them, um, you can actually find a relationship between this drug activity and the uh, semi-theoretically um, calculated properties. And sometimes these softwares are, uh, um, are uh, facilitated with these mathematical formulations because the, all these properties have been investigated in the literature for a long time and all these formulas have been embedded into the software. All you have to do is draw a molecule and optimize the molecule and, and feed the molecule to the software and, and, and the software produces the properties um, to you. Then use these properties and find a relation to the drug activity using mathematical modeling. So this is a long uh, process that I don't want to delve into because it can be really boring, but I can tell you in three, three points. The data set is basically the drug activity and the number of physical chemical properties that you have together. And then you create a regression model, which is based in the statistical models, regression and correlation models. Often uh, a, a complex version of it goes into machine learning. And this regression model helps us optimize the data and identify how to design a molecule, which I'm gonna talk in a bit. And if, if um, and further um, going into you know, machine learning process where you can actually create an external validation set and create a predictive ability. And um, well, I don't want to delve into it much. Here is an example of a data set. This is a small data set where I have an experimental data for a series of molecules with substituent mo moieties on a, on a phenol um, um, at ortho and meta and para positions. And these are the um, uh, BL3, BL4 to uh, JGT and so on. These, these are all descriptors that are calculated by the software. And I want to find out the relationship between the experimental data to the, the semi-theoretical data. And once it forms a relationship, a mathematical relationship, it gives, it gives a predicted value, uh, which is basically the experimental data. So it has to match the experimental data. And we go a, a, a bit further, and what we do is uh, take a, a random sample of molecules from here and separate them. So a five-member sample for, for a 22-member uh, data set is, is recommended. And once you take a, a random sample and you erase, take away the experimental data, and you only feed it with the predict, predict, predicted or, or calculated um, um, properties, and then ask the model based on its trained model, based on its training with the data, ask it to predict the um, experimental data. If the experimental data is very close to the observed, observed data, you've achieved your goal. Of course, it's way more complex than this, but I oversimplified the process so that it's in interesting and not boring. 
Well, this is exactly what I did previously in my, and this was published before. And what I did was uh, identified a series of inhibitors for calpain protein. Calpain is a protein target for muscular dystrophy and several other diseases. And these, these people have uh, already published chemically synthesized drug molecules um, with a similar skeleton um, of a molecule, which is alpha keto, keto amides. And I found similar, similar papers and I got up about 34 molecules of these and identified the uh, moieties that were being attached to this and identified them as R1 substituent, R2, R3, R4 substituents. And based on the uh, QSPR modeling, uh, I was able to predict which one, uh, which substituent has what kind of reaction to the uh, experimental data. For example, in this, uh, in, in this alpha ketoamide structure, it, the model says if we increase lipophilicity on R1, or if we increase moment of inertia on R3 and decrease shape index on R4 and so on, this will give us uh, 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 a molecule that has better activity. So we can take this into further clinical trials and through the drug process, mm -hmm. which is uh, a high probability for the drug uh, to go past all the hoops that are laid down by the FDA and all these departments for the safety of humans. Well, uh, this is a software, which is a, a Padel descriptor software, which is freely available. All you have to do is draw a molecule, probably using ChemSketch or ChemDraw softwares, and, and you have to optimize it, which is, this is a really important step. If you don't optimize it well, you're essentially feeding the wrong um, optimized molecule, wrong structure of the molecule to the software. So all the predicted, all, all the calculated properties will be wrong too. So once you feed the molecule to the software, it can basically um, calculate about 2000 of the properties. Well, you don't have to know all these molecular descriptors. Um, um, sorry. So uh, 3D structure optimization, as I said, is the most important uh, step here that is taken care of by potential energy surface concept where um, it, according to this concept, the, a, a graph drawn for the energy that is uh, um, possessed by the molecule and the bond length and bond angles provides, creates a potential energy surface. And this surface looks like hills and valleys and the, the minimum point on this, on this surface becomes the minimum energy um, uh, point, um, also called as the global saddle point uh, or global minimized energy point or something. And this point, at this point, the, the molecule has minimum energy, which means it, it can exist with this amount of minimum energy stably in a given vacuum or in a given, given milieu. And uh, uh, so this can be brought about by the software called Gaussian, which is a paid software, but there are some few um, free software as well out there and by which you can optimize a molecule. And, and after doing that, you have a 3D molecule and this molecule can be fed into the, um, um, this software to get the properties. Well, you don't have to know all about the molecular descriptors because there are so many of them out there. You, but rather than doing it blindly, just calculating all the properties, we can probably have a knowledge educated guess of what kind of descriptors we are using because all these descriptors are classified into certain classes of descriptors like constitutional, topological, like geometrical, and so on and so forth. So if, 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 if you um, predict or have an educated guess of what kind of properties you want to use, then probably you can use one of them and you probably have a better, better results. So in my PhD, uh, I am not basically right now in the lab at the University of Guelph. I'm not really uh, doing um, drug designing, although I, I intended to do a uh, hair. That was what I intended to do. My original idea was to use electro um, chemistry with drug designing combined, and this is quite new. And uh, and at first, I I 
I found out I had to learn so many other things. And then, and now I'm, I've equipped myself with electrochemistry concepts, probably my future project is this. But right now, uh, what I'm doing here is basically uh, environmental pollutant degradation process using electrochemistry. And I'm essentially using the same technique as QSPR into this um, pollutant degradation as well. So what I did basically is I drawn a, a phenol molecule and provided it with several types of moieties, MNO, methyl, and hydroxyl in different positions, ortho, meta, and para positions. And, and I got a degradation rate constants by applying electrochemistry concepts. So electrochemistry is basically, you have a cell with anode and a cathode and, and an electro, um, uh, and, uh, and you have a voltmeter that, that's, and that provides a, a constant potential to the cell and, and, you can, and you can use a particular protein or an analog in, the, in this electrolyte here, the solution. And this in here, the current is passed from anode, the cathode to the anode or, uh, and, and, and when the current is being passed between the, these two electrodes, there is a chemical reactions that are happening. So the, the proportion of current passing is equal to the chemical reaction happening within the, within the cell. So, and you can monitor this reaction with this graph, current and voltage versus voltage graph. Once you have this graph, usually the current is a straight almost a straight line, but when a reaction like oxidation and reduction happens, they, it gives out a huge peak. So by, by this way, we can actually measure what kind of reactions happening between a protein and a ligand. Uh, the, my original intention was to use an anode and immobilize proteins onto the anode and, and, and provide the analogs in the um, electrolyte solution, when these analogs bind to the active site, it gives out a current. And, and ba based on this current, I can tell there was two electrons transfer or one electron transfer or four electron transfer. And that was the idea in the beginning, but it, it turns out it's not that simple and it, it has so many hopes to um, go through as well. Well, right now I'm working on several anode uh, metals. I, I work with titanium, iridium, tantalum, and uh, nickel and, and, uh, and cobalt. And I settled with titanium dioxide, a semiconductor. And, uh, and for the future, I'm gonna use this anode in the, in the, if I ever get a chance of using this setup for drug designing. Well, in summary, Analogs and target proteins have a major role to play in drug designing. And uh, calculation of the properties of analogs itself help us to understand the mechanism of... And, uh, and computational drug designing methods help us to reduce time and cost of drug discovery process. And the QSPR modeling of all, most of all, it gives us, uh, tells us about the significant descriptors or the properties that are associated with the ligand uh, that, that will help us um, give the analog point of view um, on how it affects the activity. So um, this is basically a gist of uh, drug designing methods I've worked with. And uh, this is the summary of it. Well, Thank you for listening so patiently. And this is a picture I took recently here near my house. And uh, uh, in the, in the, not recently, this was in the last fall when this tree turned reddish color during the fall before it, uh, you know, uh, sheds all its leaves. So it's one of the beautiful pictures, I'm proud of it. And uh, on that note, I'm gonna leave you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for empowering our knowledge how bioinformatics plays a role in drug discovery, uh, physical chemical properties in computer-based drug design, and potential drug discovery process. Really, it provides a wide opportunity for all of us to explore more and more in this domain. Uh, I would like to ask any participants, uh, you can proceed with asking any questions. Uh, the chat box is open. You can post your questions.
Oh, what is a chemo? Um, it is a it is a word play uh, recently attributed to the amount of drugs, um, drug-like compounds in the database, just like proteome and uh, and the genome. Uh, they call they are calling it as chemo, uh, but I I personally wouldn't use that. But you know, it's out there. Oh, from, so the question is, what are the current approaches of drug discovery from herbal medicine? Um, as I think based on the medicinal plants, uh, the, the approach now, some of the, based on some of the papers I read, is that you isolate the, the um, products of a, uh, from the a particular part of a plant and, uh, and you identify, characterize those uh, those chemicals, and then and then we can go into drug, uh, you know, go into virtual screening that process. This is a virtual screening process is is basically the same as structure designing method, where you have active site of a protein and you have a characterized um, uh, analog from a herbal, some from plant medicinal plant or something, and you dock them together and score them based on their binding affinity. And based on their binding affinity, you can tell how better this analog can bring about conformational change. Oh, um, the question is how The question is how effective have these methods been in researching for newer antibiotics? Um, it, for newer antibiotics, I think there were few papers. Uh, I, uh, I have experience working with some other people in microbial inhibition uh, using a certain antibiotic and changing using the same structural um, uh, designing method to identify microbial in inhibition concentration, uh, which was one of the um, best ways to do right now. But I think there are not out there, there are not so many antibiotics that came through this process, but the potential is really high. So the, the other question is, how about a recently graduated person would work with drug discovery using bioinformatics? What's the very basic approach? Because this is field. This field is very interesting. Uh, it's true. Uh, that's how it got me. Yeah, I was doing. Uh, I was doing masters in genetics in in Vishakhapatnam in India. That's when I came about uh, came across drug discovery, and then I was hooked. But it it was a challenge finding a job in drug discovery for me. So I went on to do my pursue my. Uh, um, my career in chemistry now, and I'm going to use this drug discovery methods I've invested my time in into the, into whatever I'm doing right now, and probably get a better research, leading edge on the research. But if you if you talk about jobs, I think in the future there is because in India there is a, such a huge development and. Pharma, pharma companies and uh, uh, drug discovery, traditional drug discovery processes, there is a chance that in the future, they'll have their own uh, establishment of drug designing units, uh, each of these pharma companies, because it's their interest. It's in their interest because it's going to decrease the amount of money that they're putting in into identification of a drug. So this is going to be in the, in the future, but I can't tell when it's going to be. How does bioinformatics intelligence and machine learning are helping to find COVID-19 drug discovery? Well, that is an interesting question. There are several people working on this right now, and there are a few people who published in Nature uh, uh, publications, uh, which I saw recently. And, uh, and th this is one of the newest approaches that is being you know, uh, used in COVID-19. And 
I think I saw a documentary where John Hopkins University is doing a huge amount of drug testing in a conventional method. And, and uh, parallelly, there's another group working using drug designing, uh, providing some of the potential leads to the thing. And um, that's all I can tell you about that. And the next question is, due to the intake of a particular drug, mutation may occur. How to detect the mutation in the early stage? and uh, how to make sure the drug molecule has its effect only on the target and not on any other gene of the body. I think during the preclinical trials, the most of these drug candidates are tested on cells, cell lines to animal um, you know, models. That's where you um, measure the toxicity and efficacy of a drug. And but you can improve the probability of this by in the drug designing process by working with an already proven drug, the, a drug which has a skeleton that is compatible with the body. For example, uh, a drug, something very similar to paracetamol, which is widely prescribed or, 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 or aspirin or something. And, and you can probably change the, some of the structure and probably it might be less toxic and less uh, and better efficient. Um, next question is, sounds more hope to the, this emerging field for drug discovery, very potential methods in virtual screening is fantastic. Thank you very much. I, I agree, I second that motion. Um, and next question is, what are the application of phylogeny analysis in drug discovery? Well, that is an interesting question. Phylogeny and analysis is mostly used for genomic analysis to identify uh, which class of uh, genome something has originated from. I've seen few papers already on COVID-19 genome sequence phylogen phylogeny analysis, and probably that will lead to us to the model because phylogeny analysis gives us, uh, tells us which animal it probably it originated from, and probably we can use that animal as a model for clean, uh, preclinical trials. You know, That could be a wonderful way of doing it. Next question is, how bioinformatics plays a vital role in nutrition, and how will, it, how will that be the approach? Um, I'm not entirely sure about nutrition. There, there are several ways to answer that, but I'm not Pretty, I'm not very sure about nutrition. Um, maybe um, no, I'm I'm not very sure about that question. Really. So next question is: Could you name a few software apart from Gaussian for beginners? Oh yes, um, there are several software um, for molecular drawing. I think ChemDraw. Is a, is a really good software to work on. And there are, if you, also there are several independent websites provided online for chem, drawing chemicals. And you can, you can um, practice your drawing on that. And then optimizing a molecule. There are several paid softwares like Gaussian and Corina, but there are unpaid softwares like Avogadro Avogadro is a, is a software that is freely available. You can draw the molecule in it and optimize the molecule. But this, there's a catch to it. The freely software av um, available software uses a lower level of theory to optimize the op molecules. Example, like they use molecular uh, mechanics methods. And these are not very accurate when it comes to big molecules. Maybe they're accurate for phenols, you know, so if so, you have to have a, some educational guess about it. But if you want to use huge, be, better drug molecules, you have to go for paid molecule, paid software in case of uh, you know optimizing a molecule. And paid software has this capability to do using DFT calculations. If you have heard about it, density functional theory. It uses density functional theory to cre uh, to uh, calculate the minimum energy, which is most accurate compared to uh, experimental study. So um, can we try drug to treat cancer? Um, yes, 
there, there is a, a talk online on YouTube um, by, I think you have to type drug design and UCLA, uh, University of um, um, California, Los Angeles has uh, a talk, a lecturer have given a talk. I recently heard about um, uh, this talk and, and listened, it, it is one hour talk about prostate cancer and how they discovered the, the uh, drug for prostate cancer using drug designing method. And this is fairly recent as well. So yes, there is potential for that. And uh, next question is, can single cell proteins be used as drug for some diseases? Uh, I'm not sure about this. There are protein drugs that are, but are, these drugs are usually smaller than the proteins that they are binding to and they bring about the conformational change, but these are not preferred as a drug. Usually we prefer small analog particles that can be taken orally. And next question is, let's say if a drug is, sorry, uh, let me catch up. Uh, let's say if a drug is to be discovered has no similar ent entities in the databases, entities in the database that we use, how would the approach be? The approach is same as before, but then your, your, predi your prediction that this is most probable, that defeats the purpose because it, it might not be compatible with the body, so it might fail the entire process. So you can design a, a drug from the scratch. This is called de novo method of drug designing, but you know it, there is no guarantee that this will go because it might be toxic to the body. So it has to go through the rigorous process of preclinical trials before it is administered to the uh, humans. Can we know more about this, uh, about treating cancer? Uh, sh sure, um, maybe, um, I mean, all you have to type in YouTube is, is um, drug designing and UCLA. You'll get the first uh, uh, talk. I forgot the name of the person, but you'll get a first hit there. And there are a few books about it too, and uh, in cancer research. And the, some of the cancer, the, the um, journal called Cancer Research publishes a lot of these drug designing um, as well. So that journal is a, is a valuable entry for that. So the next question is, how medications are said to be developed in, for COVID-19 in the field of Ayurveda? Is there efficacy can be, their efficacy can be tested using biometrics? That is, that, that is um, um, very, um, that is fantastic idea. Actually, if you have a um, drug that works in the field of Ayurveda for, for COVID-19, if you can characterize the molecule structure, the small molecule structure, and we can definitely uh, put it through the rigorous process of virtual screening of the drug uh, target uh, COVID-19 proteins. So all the viral, viral um, virus has this um, process of affecting the body by um, entering a cell and producing a lot of viral particles and viral proteins. And these viral proteins disintegrate the cell and viral particles are released into the, into the nearby cells and they attack the nearby cells again. So in this process, these viral proteins, they are the toxic uh, um, proteins. And if you can target them, then it would be a really good uh, starting point for discovering a drug for COVID-19. How about the drug, computer aided drug designing? What is the current scenario for drug design? Uh, sorry, what about the current? So computer aided drug designing is an other name for, uh, for QSPR. So basically computer, uh, QSPR is computer aided drug designing. Well, computer aided drug designing, as I said, is, is two types. One is structure based, based on the structure of the protein uh, active site. And when you don't have the structure of the protein, you're just based on the analog uh, perception. So that is what this talk about. So when can I know more about this, about treating cancer? Uh, I think uh, somebody named Annapurna asked, asked me about it. So um, probably I can uh, send 
one or two papers about it to probably to Sudip Desar, maybe Sudip Desar can uh, distribute that to the person. Um, there's another question. Can we alter drug protein function by using bioinformatics? Uh, I mean, I think you mean drug protein interaction, which alters the function of the protein. A, a drug is an analog when it binds to the protein, it alters the function of the protein because functions of the protein are very much dependent on the conformation of the protein. Uh, the, the morphological conformation. When you add uh, a, a molecule to it, it essentially changes the conformation slightly. So, you know, it, it uh, and it changes the um, function of the protein. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Okay. Uh -huh. I could see really the talk was more engaging and uh, it was much interactive uh, in the entire session. And uh, I thank everyone for spending your quality time in this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you once again. It, uh, I'm really honored to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, so you can end the session. Thank you. Long, right? Thank you.